Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the main card fights for UFC Fight Night 173, Brunson versus Shabazin. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the main card. So in our first fight, we have in the middleweight division, Kevin Holland versus Trevin Giles. So look at the fight right here. You got two solid fighters right here with a lot of upside to them, a lot of talent. And yeah, so... How do I see this fight right here? I see Trevin Gallo is a solid fighter, heavy hands, good boxing, good offensively striking, but defensively, a lot of flaws as far as striking. Like on defense, his chin kind of hangs up there sometimes, like especially when you get pushing him back, that chin goes high up. When he gets tired, those hands get even lower, and the reflex get even, I guess the reflex start to the dull because he's tired. But when he's first starting out, he's fresh. He can beat a lot of people to punch very fast, very sharp, very powerful. But like I said, when he gets tired or when he push back, regardless, like, so even when he's not tired, when he gets pushed back, he kind of drops those hands, hangs his chin up there, hangs those hands low. But especially when he gets tired and his feet not even moving, and he just kind of just there. Like he just throw a combination or he just press him back, then throw a right hand or throw a, throw a straight or something. His chin's right there. So it starts to fall off when he, when he gets tired. Kevin Hollow on the other side, very talented, very long, very lanky, good frame, good build, both for middleweight and a welterweight division. Really think with Kevin Holland. For most careers, like it's not like he was been making too many technical flaws. Well, I guess you could say everything kind of a result of technique, but he definitely make a lot of fight IQ, poor fight IQ decisions out there. Like he'll go in these make these fights very close in like nail biting fights that don't need to be nail biting fights. Like he'll get a takedown and he'll get reversed. Uh, all right, for some reason he can't hold position. Like maybe he just I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's trying to jump a position too quickly, or maybe he's trying to do too much at one time and he loses his base. But he gets in a lot of fights that be should be real clear or real, should be fights that he can win much more more convincingly or much more definitively. And it's turned him into like 50-50 fights that don't need to be 50-50 fights. So that's really the thing on Kevin Holland. But in his last fight, he showed that if he needs to, he can, when he puts all everything together, he can really go out there and be a dominant force in this division like for years to come. Like in the last fight, he just went out there, put his opponent in clinch, kneed in the body, and it was a wrap. And finished with some ground and pound and just showed, ran right through opponent. And Trevor Giles on the side, I think he had like one win or two wins in the UFC. Then he was on the ride on a two-fight losing streak. Both fights, they got dropped and then submitted in those last those two losses. And then he got a rebound fight over a former lightweight, turned to a welterweight, who fought him on short notice up a middleweight. So, yes, James Krause is a dangerous fighter, but you fought a guy that was a former lightweight, turned welterweight, on short notice, up a division. So he was fight on short notice, and you had a full camp. And then also, like I said, he was up a weight class and it was on short notice. So they had the gas tank he needed and they had the, like, to really execute in those positions. And it still was a very close fight. And really, Trevor Giles just won because he was bigger, stronger, landed some shots, and they were affecting um, James Prowse. And he didn't really have that energy later on, later rounds. But even still, at points, you saw the same falls from Giles where he kind of dropped his hands and got, started going straight back. But it's just like he was going against a guy that really wasn't that weight class. So when he got caught by those shots, he kind of ate them a little bit better. He still got stunned by them. But it's like, say he fought another middleweight. Or actual middleweight, those shots would have dropped him the same way he got dropped in those other fights. So, flaw is still there. He looked clean. He looked much better in that fight, but it's still same flaws were there. Like when he started going back up, still same flaws. Look, look better, but same flaws were there. But how to get to the point of this prediction right here? I just think um, Kevin Holland just has more tools than Trevor Gallo. I think he's a little bit longer, faster, not as much power, but he has more angles. I mean, he has more tools in his toolbox. Like he he's a better grappler, the better. Offensively, defensively, so he can mix those takedowns in and get control on the ground. On the feet, he's longer. He presents far more than just punches. I think mean, Trevor Gallows presents more than just punches as well on the feet, but Holland definitely mixes up much more. Definitely much more unorthodox. Definitely the rangier of the two. Gallows a little bit more, like more, like had a little bit more power. I mean, he had a lot more power, but Holland has much more, much more versatile. So I feel like Holland will mix in takedowns, or at least the threat of takedowns. I think he could win in the clinch. And really, I think he just uses limb, tack the body, tack the leg. Don't really allow Giles to get into his range. Then really start to press him back. Once kind of f figured him out a little bit. Still a competitive fight. I think he's going to be respecting of Giles' power and his explosiveness. But going to try to drain, pretty much try to hold fun this fight, pick him apart from a distance, then try to drain him on the inside, try to drain him down, try to take away some, sap some of that power out of him, mix some takedowns. But a competitive fight nonetheless. But I think it's a fight where Kevin Holland just has the more tools right now. And it is the fighter, that, the more proven fighter at the moment. And like I said, more facets, more avenues to victory. And he's going to tap into all those avenues 
to get a decision over Gauss. So in this fight, I got Kevin Holland via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the lightweight division, Lando Venata versus Bobby Green. So look at this one right here. You got Venata versus Bobby Green. In the first fight, Venata almost got him out of there in the first round. And then he started to slow down like he typically does in some of these other fights. Like I, think, I think the trend is kind of tra- changing, but still is not fully changed for him. Like he, in the first round, he's like a monster. Like he, like he like can beat just about anyone in that first round. Or literally can beat anyone in the first round. I'm not saying he will be, would beat anyone in the first round, but he can beat just about anyone in his weight class in that first round. And then like second round, he's okay. Then the third round, he just kind of like really not there. Like he just drawing stuff out there, no setup. Leaving his chin hanging out there to be countered, to be tagged, and that's really what happened in the first fight. First fight, he was—I mean, the first in the first fight, the first round, he was a monster. Almost got Bobby Green out of there. Second round, Bobby Green started to get back in the fight. In the third round, Bobby Green just started to unleash on Venata. And if that round, that fight had a one more round, Venata probably would have got knocked out. That's how the fight was looking like. First round, beast. Second round, real competitive. Third round, Venata just, especially going down the stretch, was getting chewed up, getting his head ripped all left, right, busted up. It was like, like I said, he was looking like he was about to get put out of there, but the round, the, the third round ended. I think that, that could trend continue for about three, four fights. But I think in this Madero's fight, he was able to hold his composure through the first, through the second. And then kind of th- in that like last, what, round, last two minutes, he didn't really get destroyed or nothing by um, Madero's in the last two minutes, but he definitely started to fade off in that third round towards the like last two minute mark. So it was still like kind of a trend. Like first round, he can beat just about anyone in that first round. Second round, He's working on like he's looking. He can hold his own. Like he can keep that same pace from the first round. He's definitely not gonna look as good in the second round as he looking in the first round. But he can at least kind of maintain it a little bit better now. Third round, like I say, for the first what two minutes he's all right. But then like he start to get dip into that further, like that last three minutes, two minutes, he starts to fade off again. So still the trend in there with him. But I see this one against Bobby Green versus Lando Venata. I just think um, I just I don't think um as far as the wrestling, I think Venata would be the better wrestler. Between two, especially defensively between the two, so I feel like this fight will mostly play a part. I mean, take place on the feet. And then on the feet, Bobby Green has some slick boxing, he has some good range, he has a good jab, good straight. He's, you know, he's a very slick boxer. I think he can definitely tag Venata up at points. But I think Venata just presents more wrinkles in his game. He brings kicks. He a little bit more fat. He a little bit fast, a little bit sharper with his strikes. Packs a little bit more power consistently throughout. Like I said, those kicks, the range control. The mixture of the wrestling, I think the chains get, get a little bit better. And I think the only reason Bobby Green got into, really got back into the fight was because the fight slowed down, or at least Venata slowed down. So if Venata can keep maintain and keep a decent pace in this fight and don't slow down. I mean, he's still probably gonna slow down that third round, but if he can maintain that decent pace, especially from like set a pace in the first round, maintain it in the second, and at least hold it up, semi hold it up in the third round, this should be his fight to win. I think. Um, like I, said, I think he could be. Green to the punch. I think he beat him to the kick. Control the range with his kicks to the body, to the leg. Little step and side kicks. It really has been unorthodox. Never. Really, and nothing about Bobby Green. Let me say why. Another reason why I'm so confident in Venata, or at least why I'm like leaning to Venata in this one, is because Bobby Green is technical and talent. I mean, as talented as he is, and as good as his boxing is, and as good as this and that about him is, Bobby Green. The reason why he lost some of these decisions that probably should have went his way. Like even what I'm gonna say about him and saying like, oh. He lost the decision because of this. I still feel like he beat Tornado. I feel like he beat him um, close. But the reason why he loses some of these fights or why it's even an opportunity for him to lose these fights is because he's just too patient out there. Like, it's a good thing to be patient and a good thing to just be calm and always just focus on being technical. But a lot of times the judges are going to, unless you're just shutting down your opponent completely technically, the fact that you allow your opponent to even get off some shots or at least look like they're being aggressive, in a close fight where you only got maybe out landing about two, three, four, five strikes, or maybe like one or two strikes around, they're gonna lean to aggression a lot of times in these fights. And Bob Green just a lot of times he's too patient out there. And I feel like Venata's gonna be creating activity. So even if the fight's close, or even Bobby Green is technically being the more technical fighter, landing the more significant strikes. I feel like in this fight, it's gonna be a fight that I feel is gonna be close regardless. But I feel like Venata's gonna be more active out there. And I, start, and I feel like Venata's gonna outstrike Green as well as far as significant strikes. But also on the top of that, even say Green does land a little bit more simple strikes, it's only going to be about so much. And I feel like Vinal's going to be a little bit more aggressive. He's going to be doing stuff a little bit more flashy, especially in those first two rounds. Unless he get caught by something, like a big shot or a big counter, I feel like Vinal's shot's going to be the ones that the judge is going to be looking at more. So really outside of counter or a real good jab or a real good straight, Vinal's sh- like little spinning back kicks or a little stepping side kicks or a little overhand or a little check hooks he throw out there. Those are things that's going to be more received by the judges. He's going to be one pressing the pace. 
And that's going to be, like I said, more of a two by judge. Like, Bobby Green's too content to kind of coast out there. It's not like he's coasting, but he's kind of waiting for things a little bit and trying to see things. And I feel like Vinado is going to be actually being active out there and trying to set things up. And that's what's going to allow Vinado, to, like I said, the judge is going to receive that more. And that's going to be a big part of Vinado winning. I still see it as a competitive fight. I see it as a close fight, a close technical fight, but Vinado landing more strikes, being more versatile, and being more active. And that's what's going to win him the decision. Like the third round going to be, be very interesting, but the first two rounds probably just lean clearly to Venata. Third round, close and competitive, but Venata's going to win based off the first two rounds, regardless if the third round goes to him or Green. So in this fight, I got Lando Venata via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the welterweight division, Vicente Luque versus Randy Brown. So look at this fight right here. I think this is like the straight to the point. I think this is a fight that's a batter of, Styles fight, like Styles make fights. Like Vicente Luque beat Nico Price twice, and um, Nico Price beat Randy Brown in that weird situation. And you know, you can use MMA math. Can you really use MMA, MMA math in that situation? It's not like um, Nico Price is completely out technique, completely just out destroyed um, Randy Brown. And that fight, it was like Nico Price was good at first, and then it started, their momentum started to shift heavily to Randy Brown. And they got in a weird situation, like a rare, weird scramble position. And Nico Price landed at a uh, Finished him from a position that no one has ever been finished before in, and no one has ever been finished in that position again since. So it was like it was a weird situation. They kind of got caught in a little leg tangle. He was turned around, got hit from the back with the little hammer fist with his hook, hooked him with his his foot, hit him with some hammer fist, and knocked him out. But it's not really MMA math really don't work in that case. And then you can say, oh, um, Brian Barbarina gave Vicente Luque a hard fight, but Randy Brown just completely destroyed him. So. You can use MMA map however you want in this fight, but how I see this fight right here is that Vicente Luque is an amazing striker. He has solid grappling, but he's not a guy that's going to try to take you down. I mean, he could chew you up and probably put you in a dark zone, but he, and he can probably mix some takedowns, but he's not a guy that's going to go out and just mix in the full game all the time. Most times he's going to want to go out and strike. He might mix a takedown every now and then, but more so he's not going to be a guy that's going to be heavy pressure and mixing and striking, throwing heavy shots and like level changing going for takedown. That's not his style. Most times he's going to try to chew you up on the feet unless he feels like the fight's close and he needs to get a takedown or the takedown just presents itself so easily that he just fills it and makes it, and mixes it in there. But typically he's not a guy that's going to go for a lot of shots. So it's more so going to be a striking match with him. And yes, Randy Brown's takedown defense is a little bit questionable, grab a little bit questionable, but I don't see Vicente Luque going out there and making it a grappling match. So I just see it's a striking matchup. And I see like Randy Brown's an amazing striker and at any point he has so much talent he could just flip a switch and then be that big threat in the division. Outside of against grappling, like he still needs a lot of work on his grappling. Like he got a submission in the last fight, but still needs a lot of work on his grappling. Like his takedown defense, his takedown offense, his jiu-jitsu and all that. He still needs a lot of work on that. But in this fight, I don't see this fight where Vicente Luque is necessarily going to force grappling on him, force wrestling on him, force jiu-jitsu on him necessarily. And when I see like Randy Brown's a much longer, taller fighter between the two. And Vicente Luque... And also, they're both very technical fighters. I think Vicente Luque is probably a little bit better of a striker, but given the range, given the height... Given the length and the technique of Brown versus Luque, who has solid technique as well, but his defense has always been sketchy. Like it works, and probably on the stats statistically wise, it holds up. But when you look at it, it's like he get less. A lot of big shots get slipped on there, and even if I can think of Price, he got tagged a couple times. He gets by Arena. I think he got dropped in that fight. So his de- defense definitely needs a lot of work. Or it's always seemed to be kind of sketchy. Like his offense. No questions about the offense, but the defense definitely question. But given the length of Randy Brown, the speed. The technical skills and the length of Randy Brown, I feel like that's gonna be a, like picked apart by. I mean, I I mean those holes are gonna be picked apart or at least picked at by the longer Randy Brown, longer, faster, technical fighter. Is he the more technical fighter? No, but he's longer, ranger. And when you're longer and ranger, you got the ability to to pick into these holes in people's game. And like Luke, he likes it. Doesn't really defend himself the best. And I feel like Randy Brown with that length is gonna be able to exploit the technical. I mean, the defensive holes of Luke. Still a competitive fight, but I feel like Randy Brown will be able to slip some hooks in there, kind of come down the middle, come up top, throw, use his leg, use his reach to make Luke had to work hard to get on the inside. And just like I said, find those holes, stab that distance with his kicks, and then find the holes around the guard. I don't think he'll get a stoppage, but I think he'll be able to use his length, use his kicks to pick up volume and land some, a lot of clean shots on Luke when he's trying to get in on the inside to land his own shots. Competitive fight, but I think Randy Brown, like I said, with that reach and with the whole defensive holes of Luke, I think Brown should be able to land a lot of sh- good amount of significant shots and exploit those holes and be able to outland and outstrike Luke in this one. Competitive fight, but 
I got green in this one. I mean, I got brown in this one. So in this fight, I got Randy Brown via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the women's flyweight division, Joanne Calderwood versus Jennifer Maya. So look at this one right here. You got Joanne Calderwood versus Jennifer Maya. And how I see this fight right here is Jennifer Maya, probably the better grappler, but she doesn't shoot very many takedowns. She's kind of like a pressure, pressure, a heavy handed striker. You know, she's not like a really a knockout pop puncher but she's a fighter that's going to try to pretty much get in your breathing room and be in your face and make you have a very stressful time that's her style not gonna mix in too many takedowns now she's going to get and Calderwell who like this appears and seems to be the more technical striker and statistically wise I think their striking I mean their striking defense is about the same but and their strikes land is about well Calderwell lands a little bit more strikes than her and she's more accurate by like 10% or 12% more accurate so it shows in the stats and it shows in the fight. So, like, stat, statistically, she's a more technical striker. And, st- like, in actual fight, she's the more technical striker. And statistically, it shows that she's the more technical striker. So, in this fight where Maya's not going to really mix in and grappling, like, maybe she could try to adjust it. But from what we've seen, she only averages less than, like, one takedown a fight. So, she's not really shooting that very many takedowns. And I think she only shot one takedown in one fight in, in her career in the UFC. And there's only, like, shot one. I mean, she shot, like, two takedowns, got one, and missed the other one. I don't know. Well, the case is... She don't shoot very many takedowns. And he's going to get some more technical striker. So I see it's a, te- a striking matchup. And Carter was just a more technical striker. I think um, Carter was being a technical striker that she is and the post striker that she is. I think she'll take advantage of Maya's aggression and land a lot of counters and just really use her footwork a lot in this fight and just pick her apart, make walk Maya into strikes in. But I still think Maya's going to be able to get in on the inside, land some big shots here and there. But Carter was going to maintain her composure, get back on her bike, get back to her setup, and keep walking Maya to, into counters. Make a respect to striking, and like I said, this be the a, a one beat ahead in a competitive fight, nonetheless. But being a sharper, more technical fighter, landing the more significant, the more strikes. I mean, landing more overall strikes and landing more significant strikes. Competitive fight, but I think Calder Wild strikes her and, and wins this fight pretty cleanly. So in this fight, I got Joanne Calderwood via decision. Now, now to our main event, we have in the middleweight division, Derek Brunson versus Edmund Shabazin. So this fight right here, I'm going to get to the point on this one. I'm not going to try to drag it too much, but kind of get to the point. Like I said, get to the point of this. So um, say if they fought like two or three fights ago, this fight would be very much in Derrick Brunson's favor in my fact, in my in my opinion. Because um, when I looked at um, Edmund Shabazin about two, three, maybe four fights ago, I saw the path of beating him as a fighter with like heavy hands that, you know, gain that respect, then pressure heavy. Like you, get, you have the power to make your opponent respect you. Then you can push them back. And then mix and take down. Then the, as far as the, the grappling style would be a style that favors position over submission over finish. So like your style where you're going to get that control. Maybe not the most exciting fighter. Maybe not the fighter that's going to get the finish necessarily all the time. Or at the rate that people would love or see as dominant or see as this and that. But a style that's consistent and you could t- consistently pick a victory. Like So heavy hands, heavy pressure, push them back, get the cage takedowns and control. I saw that style that could beat Shabazin. But now looking at him now, like two, three fights now. I mean, like after those two or three fights, and especially in the last fight, you just start to see the new wrinkles. Like his takedown of offense go better, his takedown defense get better, his footwork get better, striking get better, his confidence ought to get better. So that same style is not the style to beat him just yet. I mean, like a real high level fighter of that style can definitely cause him problems. Like I'm not saying Derrick Brunson isn't a high level fighter of that style, but he definitely got his own holes and his flaws. I think Edmund Shabazin can more so pick his flaws than Brunson can pick Shabazin's flaws. But Brunson is a very experienced fighter. And he has, what, probably the most wins in middleweight division over the past, what, five, six years? So definitely nobody to sleep on. But I just feel like Edmund Shabazin has made some improvements. And I didn't feel like at his current moment, his current director, and right in his current head of steam right now, and also recent performance versus recent performances, I think um, Shabazin just looked sharper as a recent. And it looked fresher and like it, it's leaning towards him as a right now. Because Brunson's last two fights, yes, they were victories, but they were very close fights that maybe two, three years ago or fights that he probably could have finished. Like, he was, didn't have the most cardio. When he was, I mean, his cardio, I mean, he has cardio, but he definitely looked exhausted going for some takedowns, started to look more fatigued out there and like in some of these fights and just had to really just put, like bite on his mouthpiece and just had to grit through these victories that, like I said, that probably a couple years ago he would have finished, so. He's not looking the best in his career, but he's finding ways to win. Regardless, like it's like a point when you fight a veteran fighter, like 
they're not as good as they used to be, but they're still finding ways to win. That's kind of where I see with Derrick Brunson. I don't think that's going to be good enough to beat Shabazin. Like, yes, he got that experience. Yes, he got, like I said, some stuff that in the past could have been a threat, I mean, a big threat to Shabazin. But right now, I think, like, I don't think, Edmund, I mean, I don't think Brunson's going to be necessarily be the mixing the much wrestling as he needs to beat Shabazin. Then my feet, Brunson has some power and stuff, but he still has the same defensive hold. Like, he still kind of hangs that chin up. So, and, like, when you throw a chain of combinations on him, like I said, those the, the defensive holds even present themselves even more because, like, you Maybe one shot, he kind of avoid it all, kind of skip out of it. But like, when you change stuff up, especially like how Shabazin showed in that last fight, he could chain that little head kick in there, like two, three punch combos, then finish off with like a head kick or a faint, then head kick, like stuff like that. I think that's going to set Brunson up. Like Brunson, when you start, when you start to really set stuff up on him, I think it's going to leave open and allow Shabazin land big shots, land big damage. I don't think Br- he's going to finish Brunson, but I feel like he's going to be a definitely exploit a lot of striking holes and a lot of tendencies of Brunson. I don't feel like Brunson's going to be able to necessarily implement as high a pace of a wrestling focus he needs to. And I don't feel like his right hand or that one power punch or power alone is going to necessarily be able to shake Trebazin like it maybe did, like it would have did a couple fights ago. So, to, and it's to like summarize this fight, I think Derek Brunson has a style that could be a problem for Trebazin, but I feel like Trebazin has made improvements. And I feel like Brunson has kind of dipped off. I don't think he's going to be able to necessarily implement wrestling as much as he needs to. I don't think he's going to be as versatile with his striking as he needs to be out there. I feel like Shabazin is going to be sharper. His technique is going to be much cleaner. His stuff is got, like, not going to be as predictable. Like, with Brunson, like, you're going to kind of be able to predict. Like, Brunson can be unpredictable at times, but I feel like for the most part, Shabazin is going to be able to see from tape what Brunson is going to present and be able to address everything, every single threat Brunson presents him. Like, you take him down. Yes, I think Brunson has success, but I don't think he's going to be able to have continued success with his wrestling or continued success with his control. You know, on the feet, I think Shabazz will be sharper, more technical, and more composed out there. And it's chained together, it's striking better, and it's fighting a much more, much cleaner fight out there. Competitive fight, nonetheless, you're going against a, a, a veteran who's still very dangerous, but Shabazz at this moment just, in my opinion, just the better fighter at the moment. So in this fight, I got Edmund Shabazz in via decision. And that concludes my fight predictions for the main card of UFC Fight Night 173, Brunson versus Shabazz. And as always, Thanks for watching.